Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hi, Jake. How are you doing? Hi, good evening. I'm fantastic. It's great to see so many people in the, uh, in the chat. Yeah, it's very nice. I've seen some people in there who take fabulous before and after photos as well. So we're going to be getting some uh, tips from them, I hope. <laughs> Dr. Alex, I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Uh, if you haven't been to on a, one of our webinars before, let me do quick introductions. And um, I'm Sam, I'm the clinical director at Linton. This is Jake, he is our digital marketing guru. So has got loads of experience in content creation, is really passionate about making good quality content without big massive budgets or without a team of experts. So we're gonna pick his brains for some tips as well today. Um, if anyone's got any questions, you've got a Q and A function uh, there. So please do put them in there. Um, we'll be chatting, we'll be checking as we go along. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll answer, we're happy to answer questions as we go along basically. Okay, all right, well, let's make a start then. Um, let's see. There we go. So first of all, why take photos? <laughs> well, there's a number of reasons, obviously, I mean, to assess your treatment results and from a promotion and marketing, completely key, you know, but also it's really useful for uh, recording any pre-existing skin conditions. So uh, for example, you may have done tattoo removal and uh, you may see that there is some textual change to the skin through where the through the process of the tattoo being applied. So, you know, if you can document that before you start treatment, then if there's anything that happens post-treatment, you can sort of say, well, that was there to start with. If there's any pigmentation change, that kind of thing. So it's really important for that reason. Uh, showing skin reactions after treatment, that can be really useful as well. So um, it's a really good tool to make sure that you have got the reaction that you're expecting, that, that everything was not too pronounced, that kind of thing, for example. Um, but also to show other people, you know, what they can expect after treatment. If you're having a, a full face CO2 treatment, you're gonna get great results, but you're also gonna have a fair bit of downtime and people need to be aware of, of you know, it depends what they do. Some people are happy to just go into work and, you know, say what's happened to them. Other people want to lock themselves away for a week, you know, so show them, you know, the typical kind of skin reactions so that they know what to expect, when they should be worried, you know, or whatever. Uh, it's great for medical legal reasons to have it, you know, in the worst case scenario. But as I say, it's really, it's just about demonstrating that the treatment's working, um, and also showing that to people. If you're not putting your great before and afters on your social media, then you're missing a trick really, you know, because it's a great marketing opportunity. So I thought, Jake, Jake, just give me a thumbs up. Yeah, Jake, <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought it'd be worth just looking at a few before and afters. We can mm. talk through um, what makes them good, what makes them bad. In some cases, we've got some awful ones that I'll share with you. Um, but, um, Oh, also, of course, it's worth pointing out, I've got these pictures of these fancy, you know, DSLR cameras here that cost hundreds, if not thousands of pounds in some cases. Who uses them these days? You know, everyone is just using their smartphone or their mm. iPad or whatever. And you can get fabulous pictures with that. Do you agree, Jake? Oh, absolutely. I, th I think access to kind of high quality photography that doesn't have to be kind of built by a team of experts has been is more accessible than ever. So I think it's, um, you know, we've got all that power in the palm of our hands and it's just about making the best possible use of it, which is, you know, it's, it's never been easier. Yeah, I'm aging myself now. But when I first started at Linton, we were literally using not even digital SLRs, but, you know, SLRs with film. Then you go off and get film developed. It was, so, you know, it's, it's yeah, so much better now. Um, OK. All right. So post-treatment reactions you know, it's really nice to be able to demonstrate, you've got, look, these are tiny little vessels here, but you can see immediately after they've gone, we've got a mild bit of erythema, but you know that that's nothing to worry about, that's what we'd expect. So that, that demonstrates you, A, treatment results, two, that, you know, you've, you've got a good skin, expected skin reaction there. Same here with this Campbell de Morgan, nice sort of cherry red, lesion beforehand and immediately after treatment we can see that darkening so that's that's indicating that you've got your good endpoints there so that's really useful to to show to people and to demonstrate that the treatment you know has, has been effective 
another, I can remember speaking to someone once who um, she had uh, lentiginous age spots on her hands and she got fabulous results. I saw her about two months after I did the treatment and I said, are you happy with it? And she said, oh, I am now. She said, but it was awful afterwards. And, you know, I know I did the consultation with her. I know that we spoke about the fact that it would be dark and perhaps a bit red. She was quite elderly, so it can take a little bit longer to heal. Um, but, you know, I clearly didn't make it, you know, it wasn't clear enough to her that it was going to look much worse before it got better. And whether, you know, a picture tells a thousand words, doesn't it? If you can show someone a photograph and say, look, this is what it's going to look like, um, it's going to look worse, then that can be really useful. And there's no better example, <laughs> really, than the purpura that you get following a pulse dye laser treatment. I can remember speaking to a dermatologist once who said, um, she said, well, I always tell people they're going to be bruised after treatment, but they're always still surprised. Well, <laughs> you, you, if you're expecting a bruise, you're probably not expecting this kind of reaction, are you? And this, for those of you that don't use pulse dye lasers, you know, this isn't an adverse reaction. This is, this is an, an end point of treatment, of a successful treatment. So, you know, that, that's bruising that would be gone, you know, usually within a week, maybe two weeks. But, but clearly, you know, if you're just expecting to be a bit bruised, <laughs> that's very different to what we're seeing in these photos here. Um, this is another example that, that, uh, that I use. This was part of a, a clinical trial that we were doing at a hospital comparing IPL and electrolysis treatment. And this particular client responded least well of everyone that we treated. I don't know if you can see here that she had red hair. Basically, we know that red hair is difficult to treat with, with laser and light. Um, but she was pretty despondent. She said, I just don't think that either of the, I, you know, nothing's worked really. I'm still shaving every day. Um, and that, you know, she was still shaving every day, but when we looked at the photos and we sat down with her and looked at them, you can see this is the side that was having the electrolysis. Now, five treatments of electrolysis on hair this dense isn't really gonna do very much. We know that, you know, it can take years and years to get good clearance. But when we look at the IPL side, Yes, she's still got hair. You can see why she's still shaving every day. But I think it does demonstrate, you know, patchy clearance, doesn't it? Mm. And so that would give you the confidence. It would give me the confidence to say, well, actually, I think we, you know, we're getting somewhere here. If you, Obviously, it's up to the client, but if she wants to carry on with treatment. I think, you know, you could probably um, get some improvement there. So really useful in, in that kind of case. I Another person who springs to mind, I spoke to someone once who was having a sideburns treated and she had about three hairs present there and she wasn't happy with the results and I said but there was no pictures no before photographs so I said well you know you've got very few hairs there and she said but I had this many hairs before and of course I'd without a before photograph I had no way of saying to her actually this is a fabulous result because if she had three hairs to start with then it wasn't a fabulous result I guess um I mean sorry Sam it's, it's yeah. just worth putting uh, putting there that um it's it's very easy to think of before and afters as uh, and treatment photos in general as things that you want to use to sort of wow potential clients and win new business but it's it, it you know it sort of makes you make the point really well here that it's re a really good tool for you for use Absolutely. throughout your business as well so you're setting patient expectations you're also sort of using it to help them on their journey and you know not only is that really really good it's good value for money almost you know you're you're investing in good photos etc then if you're using them more you're getting more value out of it and the thing so, is people, people don't remember what they look like at the start as well no. you know so it can be really useful to i mean we'll, we'll talk a little bit later on about um consent but even if people don't want their photos on on the web and i understand that you know i would still you know try and encourage all of your clients in fact or insist in fact on, on taking photographs at the start. I do, I do think mm. it's really important. It should be part of the whole sort of consultation process, really. Oh, definitely. Uh, so let's look at some photos. Here is a chap before and after. So obviously a nice result, but what's nice about this photograph, I think, is that we've got a nice plain background. We can kind of overlay the photos on top of each other. Have you seen those fabulous little sliding tools that you can use mm. where you can sort of draw it across? I think they're really effective. So that would be perfect with this. But he's we've got him standing in the same position, in the same position 
um, you know, against the wall with the same background. So I think that's a really good before and after photograph. Um, this is another one. This is following a, a CO2, uh, a smart side treatment, skin rejuvenation. Fabulous result, as you can see. And they're using uh, skin imaging systems to sort of take the photograph. So the chin's rested on there, there's a headrest there, although she's not quite centered on it. But you know, so th that can be, they can be really useful tools for, for, for consistency. But of course, you know, not everyone's got those and they're, they're not completely necessary either. We've got, um, here's one, some of you might recognize her, it's our training manager, Re. And again, this is with the skin imaging system, but that positioning of the head and having it at the same angle is, is really useful with this but as I say you don't you don't need it I've got one here he's in the same position good plain background black background in this case um and you know clearly a good photograph head band on in both cases so they've tried to be as consistent as possible as well this is another one uh, which again I think is a good photograph how we could improve it maybe I mean look it's minimal because you can't see much background but I'd always suggest a plain background if you can mm. the reason I included this one because a really good tip when you're doing that sort of angle is that if you can line up the nose and the cheek which you can see is sort of done there not quite here but then it does mean that you've always got the same angle so that that is quite a good tip I think we've got a few questions already let me just have a look at those quickly before we go any further um, my main issue is the cooling gel, the, under, the ultrasound gel, and how the skin looks in the photo. Even without any actual treatment, it looks totally different before and after the products. Yeah, I think, right, yeah, you're dead right. You need to do, uh, it's, it's all about consistency, and we'll talk about that. So you do your, your um, I think, I guess you're saying that you've done the treatment, you've put the gel on, you've taken it all off. And then it still looks different. Is that what you're saying, Alan? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, if, if you've got the same lighting, it shouldn't look that much different, I guess. If you've. Hmm. All right, that's a really good point. I guess what I would be saying is that ideally, before every time they come in for treatment, do a, a photograph. So if you're if you're talking about Looking at the skin reaction, yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's tricky. But if you're if you're trying to get good before and afters, kind of, you know, do it, do your do your um, picture before the if you're if you're having a course of treatments, you know, or get them to come in another time. That's ideal. That's what you want. You want to do your course of six treatments and then get them to come in, you know, one to three months afterwards and have their after photo mm -hmm. at that point. But Lauren said, my clients are very wary of being recognized. I think that's a really good point and we'll come on to yeah. that in the next slide or so. Um, yeah, how do you manage with different lighting? We're gonna talk about that because that's really key. You're, you're absolutely right, Suzanne. Um, so, oh, sorry, let me, mouse isn't working. Yeah, you talked about people not, people not wanting to be sort of recognizable. And of course, we've all seen the pictures where they put like a strip over the eyes. Doesn't really make that much difference, does it, in all honesty? Um, so zooming in can be really useful for this. So, for example, this in, in this case, if we had a full face photo, I'm not sure that the improvement in the, in the pore size and the skin texture would even be that apparent. So cropping areas and zooming in on, on in fact, not even zooming in, but cropping the areas that you want can be really useful and that can really help um, if you've got someone that doesn't want their face plastered all over the internet. It's um it's worth noting there, Sam, that and on the while well, you mentioned zooming on the topic of zooming, um if you know, for example, we're using uh smartphones to capture uh photographs, um it would be advisable to get closer to the client. Don't use the zoom function on the phone because it, it sort of instantly degrades the photo. So um, it's really good to, you know, get to take the best possible photo first and yeah. then crop later on at the highest resolution. So that, so what you end up doing is instead of getting far away and using the zoom and then having to crop further and everything's very grainy and pixely, it you've sort of wasted the opportunity. But if you take a really good photo first at the right distance, 
then the the cropping task like later down the line becomes so much easier yeah that's a really good point i mean in it you know again in the old days we'd have these macro lenses and things like that you just you, you just don't need that anymore really if you or i'm talking you know if you've got a good quality you know newish uh, uh phone or mm. ipad or whatever um here's another example of someone that you know if you just so, you know people might not want their full face but if you were to show your client this and say how do you feel about you know just that area um being on they might they might agree to that and you can see that here actually that what we want to look at is the skin texture slightly out of focus maybe here but i think you can still see a good improvement in those lines some improvement in the jaw uh, there as well uh, so again and a plain white background there This is another nice one. Again, consistent sort of angle. I don't think, I think actually probably lying on the bed in this one, but nonetheless still, you know, a good angle. The labels can be, uh, especially if you're, you know, if you're just using it for your own sort of internal purposes, they can be really useful for, for identifying your clients. They can also help if, you, if you're finding it difficult to focus as well, actually having the label on there can help with the focusing sometimes. Um, this one okay this one's an interesting one obviously a very good result on those big vessels there so that's demonstrated really clearly in this it's hard I guess it's hard to know if the lighting in the room is exactly the same now this person had I, I'm assuming ND YAG on these vessels and then IPL all over to reduce the redness so it's it's hard to tell, I guess, how much of that improvement in the color is due to treatment or due to different lighting conditions. And that's always a difficulty, I guess. Mm -hmm. This is one of the Linton Clinic ones. And I think this is, a, this is an example of what I consider to be a bad before and after. And I'll tell you why, <laughs> right? This is about the pigment clearance. And you can see she's had fabulous results on the pigment. Okay, but does her skin look better in this after photograph? I'm not sure it does. And it's because she's lying down on the bed like this in that treatment. And in this one, she's standing up. So it's made her nasal labial folds look more pronounced. It's made her skin, you know, just look a bit more lax overall. So this is why it's so important to make sure that you are consistent also things like you know the the towel on the head all right it's not the end of the world but it would look better if she either had a towel on her head in both photographs or, or didn't in, in both ideally but all's not lost here because we can still you know crop and and zoom in on the areas and then that demonstrates really nicely doesn't it the improvement in the pigment mm. and the photos on the side as well they do the same thing too so Again, that could have been much better. This picture could have been much better, I think, if we'd sort of, you know, just been consistent with the positioning of our client. Oh, this is this one is again, it's a Linton one. I actually treated this woman many years ago, a rosacea. She had a fabulous result, but I think this is a terrible before and after. <laughs> and again, so I, I know because I know her, I know she had a very good reduction in her redness but the lighting is not quite the same here, is it? The zoom is different on both as well. So, you know, mm. that's an example of where we could have done better, I think. Um, but, <laughs> saying that, <laughs> you don't want them to be too good. This is a, uh, well, I won't, I won't name the company. It's not a laser treatment. It's another rejuvenating procedure. Um, and clearly her skin, looks better but is this trustworthy <laughs> yeah is this really a before and after photograph where they've got every single hair to fall in exactly the same way i mean that just screams photoshop to me yeah i mean to sort of jump in on this one i think you can you can stage hair but there's there's a point you know that the, the, there's not a hair out of place there in the <laughs> in the after photo um and i, I think you know this um this is a really good example of editing versus preparing. Now we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later on, but 
you know, the, the idea of editing a photo to make it better for publication is you can co- kind of risk your credibility by doing that. Yeah. So um, this is sort of, I believe, and Sam does believe as well. I believe that this is a, an example of that. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, it does look, I mean, casting my sort of content creator eye on this, it, it, it does look like it's been airbrushed because it's, it's just a bit, too good well, it just makes me not believe any of the other photographs mm. on the website either you know it's so i think it's really i mean you you you, you say it's it, it's about preparing the photo not editing i like that because you know we don't want to be using any filters for for clinical mm. photography we shouldn't be doing that at all um obviously so uh but you know if people can come in especially i would say with with body shaping treatments because sometimes if people have got different underwear you know on that can completely sort of change the areas that you're seeing so if 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 people can come in wearing the same clothes great but you know we don't have to have them looking completely identical like this um consent we mentioned earlier so consent is really really important um you should be when you're doing your consent for in your consultation consent for treatment sort of build into that process of consent for photography or even these days for videography as well you know because if you want to make a little reel things like that people love this you know um i would encourage everyone to i mean i don't know if you can read this but if you do want um um versions of this they've got them uh, you can find them on the customer portal or if you just drop us an email to info at linton.co.uk we can we can send you these as well but you know i would urge everyone to agree to for us to take images to monitor treatment progress um may we share your content with with linton for training things like that you know some people might say yes that's fine but you know other people might not want you to do that that's fine can we put your image video on our website or on our social media channels and again you know some people might not be happy with that but they might be happy with you using it on a you know a a board or something like that outside the clinic you know where it's not going to be seen by the whole world so you know there there are different levels of consent and I guess the key thing is that people can withdraw their consent at any Mm. time so you know all about GDPR Jake you can fill us in on (laughs) yeah it's it's worth it's worth picking up here that no one's no one's expecting anyone to be a legal expert I mean you know you, you are aesthetics practitioners and specialists and you are specialists in the treatment room um, but it's just a, a couple of bits of kind of almost high level knowledge of of good practice that will just really kind of keep you well within the bounds of the law. So, um, you know, looking at the Data Protection Act and GDPR. So there are various um, legitimate bases on which you can uh, process a customer's data, which includes their image, um, especially if they're identifiable from a photo that is then personal data. So um having and that's why we've put here you know positive unambiguous informed consent so the customer has a right to know how their image is being used where it's being used um and it must be used for that purpose um and it must be you know positive so they have to have said yes to it when informed and unambiguous you know so you can and this is you know most commonly in a signed document like this you know it's it's quite unambiguous that yes they have given their consent in an informed way um, and like Sam mentions, the customer also does have the right to withdraw um, their their consent. So you know, um, which which you have to respect. Um, a really good rule of thumb for this one is, um, and this is one I use for myself all the time when I'm working with data, um, and when I'm um, talking to people about this kind of thing, is um, what if it was your data? Um, how would you expect your data to be treated? And if you wanted to withdraw consent and you wanted to make sure you were clear on how your data is being used, things like that. So a really good rule of thumb is to think if that was my data or likeness, how would I want that to be treated? Um, and, and following that rule of thumb and, and some of these best practices will just keep you well within the bounds of the law. Um, and so, yeah, no one's expecting you to be to, to be a, a lawyer. Um, but, you know, just following some of those best practices and having it documented and, and being very clear with the patients about it, it's, it's super, super helpful for you. I think the other thing here that we've got on here is, you know, if you are using 
pictures that you have not taken, make sure that you're crediting the original source. Mm. So for it, you'll, you'll see in our, you know, the, the templates that Linton provide, which any customer is welcome to use because we've had consent from the clinics for, to, to share that, but do make sure that you're sharing the original uh, source um, on there. And um, it could be, sorry, it could be very tempting to, if, especially if you're a starter clinic, and you might just want to go, oh, I really like that. I'm, I'm going to post that because I know my machine can do that. Um, that is um, that can cause issues later on, especially if if the if the original clinic sees it, that can be that can be an issue. Um, but um, but yeah, just if 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 you're ever going to use a photo you've not taken, just make sure you've got permission to use it in in in, in the same way as you know you get consent from patients. Just making sure you can clearly state where that photo comes from. It's it's just best practice i uh, i like alan's point here is it a standard trick to make the patient look sad in the before and then smile in the after shot <laughs> 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 they can demonstrate how the treatments really improved their life i think it's great uh, victoria That's your great. question about uh it's been recorded yes it is yeah so you can yep. catch up at any time uh Satsuko, hi hello uh if clients ask me to remove all the photos i took after a course of treatments do i need to remove them uh i Yes, I think is the answer. If, if they've asked you to do that, then I think, um, so GDPR is such a tricky one. So for example, if someone sends me a CV for a job, I have to remove that after, we, well, we say six months, basically, unless you get permission uh, to do that. Now that is, that is a bit different because there's lots of personal data on there. But if someone has specifically requested that you remove the photos, Maybe, uh, I guess. I, I have a, I have a bit of input on this one, Sam, if this yeah, helps. So yeah. what, what you have with, with the processing of data, this is all very high level, but with the processing of, of, of consumer data, um, there is sort of a legitimate, you have what's called legitimate interest. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you are holding, so for example, if you'd put them on socials and you had a copy in your treatment records, on the socials, yeah, of course they come down. That's not quite, that's not, not really in question. But then, with with regard to having a treatment record for things like insurance purposes, there is a a relatively clear argument there for legitimate interest in terms of processing the data. Um, so you know you can you can work with the client on that and just you know let them know that this is this is the reason why you're keeping this photo and it will be kept. Private. But if um, uh, one resource I do recommend if you've got any doubts about um, about data law and things like that is the Information Commissioner's Office, who have a, a series of very helpful guides on all of all of this kind of thing. Um, so I would recommend checking them out if if it's if it's all in doubt. Good tip. Okay, so how do we? Some you know we've we've mentioned lighting already, and it is <laughs> single biggest factor, isn't it? So so what do you suggest, uh, Jake? How do we go about making it? consistent so yes um lighting with well, photography in general lighting is the single biggest factor in getting getting that good image um, and with smartphones and tablets in particular which is sort of what we've been talking about most so far is um that a lot of the settings on a smartphone are automatic so they are at, sort of at the mercy of the environment that you put them in so the aim is to create the best environment possible now we've all seen our fair share of of awful befores and afters taken with smartphones in dingy environments where they've put the flash on or or whatever they've done um but now we're in a we're in a position where the the equipment's been as good as it's ever been and we can make much more use of the environment so you know with lighting for example taking a moment just to evaluate the light in your room and and this can be as simple as when you next change the light bulb in your training room get as much information as you can about the bulb um because the color of light will matter now um we've got a, a slide or two later on about just to show a couple of examples of this but if um for example between yellow light and white light if you light yellow it it's going to maybe start throwing off pigmentation and highlighting things you maybe didn't want the photo to show. Um, but then, you know, so having that bit of information about your light bulb is, is going to make a difference because it's going to make you think more about how, 
how you stage stage the room or the space that you take those photos in. Um, now, flash, and we've had a couple of questions about about flash and 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 attaching light, um, some sort of light source to it to a phone. Um, now, I always say don't use flash if you can help it because um, I've got a really good couple of examples of this. So if you could go to the next slide for me, Sam. Um, this is this is Bron. She works uh, in the office at Linton, and she very kindly um, uh, volunteered to to do some uh, some photography work with me. Um, so we um, used a white space, just something nice and neutral, and uh, with just the room lights on, I used my uh, iPhone 13 Pro Max on an Amazon Basics tripod and a little uh, phone clip for the tripod. So very inexpensive, not very much um, involved at all. So I took a photo of her in the room and this is our sort of control shot. That's nice and neutral. You can see uh, Bromin very clearly um, and um, she's very well centered, no clutter. It's a nice clean photo. So if you go to the next slide, um, I started messing with the lighting conditions. So um, on the left, room lighting only. On the second photo on the right, I turned all the lights off and I just pressed. I just pointed and pressed and had the flash on. Now, as you can see, she looks somewhat startled, um, sort of a rabbit in a headlight. Um, and she even said that to me at the time. But um, with a camera flash, um, it can it can startle the customer. It can change the facial expression. Um, not to say also that it does mess with the lighting. So as you can see, the lighting is very uneven on 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 Bron. So um that's not gonna help your photos, especially if um you know if it's gonna highlight bits that you don't want to see or it's not or it's gonna wash out your your I desired sort really of area. Out, isn't it? And it's, yeah, it's yeah. Um, you just lose any so if you're trying to photograph vessels or hair, mm. it can be really yeah, impossible with a flash, I think. Absolutely. So if you nip onto the next slide for me, Sam. Now, I used an external lamp for this. I don't often recommend external lamps just because for, for photography like this, you have to put them in the same place at the same time every single time. And it can be really just a bit cumbersome. So what I did was I turned all the lights off and put a lamp on. As you can see, the, the light is very uneven on Bron. So it's very, very much on one side of her face. It's throwing the rest into shadow. Um, and it's not an ideal um, condition in which to sort of take photos, especially because the parts that are covered in light are sort of washed out. So you, you run into the same problem again of putting too much light onto the onto the subject. You... It doesn't even have to be an artificial light source, does it, Jake? If you, if you have a window mm. and it's, you know, coming in from that. I mean, if for those of us that are using lasers and IPL, we'll all have blinds on our windows anyway. But yeah, you want to... Ideally, I mean, for for the control photo we did, um, it was obviously white walls. We had a one overhead source of light, you know, the room lighting, and that was bouncing off the off the walls, and it was it was sort of diffused, so it just creates a nice gentle light. Um, so if it's a bit dark, you might be tempted then to just keep adding light. So if you go to the next slide for me, Sam, we can see here. Yeah, all right, that might look like a a pretty good result um you know so we've put the room lights on and i've put on my external lamp um and i mean i'm surprised i have she's managed to stay still all these photos are taken within about 60 seconds of each other so um what we've got here is it might look like a really good result to start with but then if you nip onto the next slide for me because i took good photos to start with i was able to zoom in and keep my quality but those two photos look like night and day to me you know, so the photo on the on the left of the screen is the control photo, and um, Ron has a, a slightly kind of rosy hue. Where in the right hand photo, it's, it, it's all gone, um, and she's got a completely different skin tone. And if if you know, um, and again, it just it offers that missed opportunity for for being able to highlight your treatments with the best results that you you can within within your environment. So you know. 
I think we it, know it, it's consistency isn't it Jake I mean if yeah. that was your before one as well that's fine as long as you take your after in the, those same conditions I think absolutely so. and, and it's consistency is key isn't it it's it's yeah. about um making sure that what you do is the same each time so that your environment's the same each time so that the first and, and there was a, a question uh from uh Suzanne I think it was in in the chat who mentioned um about um what was it I'm just trying to find it now oh there it is um about taking photos of the same client on different devices <clears throat> now um my recommendation for the sake of consistency would be to use the same device every time so if that happens to be a clinic device go that route but I would recommend definitely having the same equipment wherever possible sometimes it can't be helped but whenever it can, I would always say use the same equipment wherever possible, just for the sake of if you've created this ideal environment for your photo and you can recreate it again and again and again, the, you can concentrate on getting the best photo rather than having to go back to square one over your environment again. Um, so no, that's, that's, that was a really good question. So equipment, right. Sam's mentioned um, before digital DSLRs, um, but um yeah, the DSLR is yes, it's, it's it's the gold standard um, because it's a dedicated piece of photography equipment. You know, nobody's going to kind of um, uh, dispute that. Um, but it's not essential. So now, as we've mentioned previously, we've we've got this wonderful equipment in the palms of our hands, and it does all these weird and wonderful things. And the photography does nothing but get better. So a decent quality you know a high quality smartphone camera can achieve fantastic results when you use it properly now this is why you know we talked about things like lighting and, and environment because the good principles of photography also apply to smartphone photography as well so what we've got is um you know accessible equipment here for for high quality photography and, and most of what you will do is you know if you're thinking social media thinking on your website or you're sharing it via an e-shot and all those different uses those digital uses a, a good quality smartphone camera is going to be more than enough to to sort of do that so you don't have to go out and think right i need to go and buy a 600 pound body of a camera and i need to spend two thousand pounds on a lens no you can really make the very best of what you've got in your hand and, and it doesn't need to cost the earth I'd be interested if anyone is using, uh, you know, cameras or SLRs or, or, you know, let us know. But I think these days most people tend to be using a, a yeah, a device of some sort. If if it helps, I've never used a DSLR. I've I've been creating content for longer than I care to admit. Um, <laughs> You're young, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, yeah, I've, I've been creating content um, and taking photos for a long time and I've never used a DSLR. I've, I've just found, you know, being able to use a phone on the fly and, 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 and use it, use it well is it's just served everything I've needed it to serve and, and done everything it's needed to do. So I've never felt the need to sort of um, remortgage my house for a camera. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alan says here that he uses a DSLR. I mean, you it, it is, as Jake says, it is the gold standard. If you've got one, then definitely use it, you know, but. Um, oh, yes. Smartphone photos. So, okay, you've picked your phone up and you want to start pointing and shooting. Right. Um, so I thought it'd be great to put a couple of tips in here. Um, so often your camera app will have grid lines. Um, you can often go into, if you don't have them, you can go into your phone settings and turn them on. It's slightly different for Apple and, and Android, but you do go into your settings. Feel free to Google it and, and it will give you the instructions. But um, using those grid lines is a really useful way to help balance your shots. Um, you know, um, if you want to use a, a tripod with a with a, a mounted phone on it, which you can do, which is what I use for those photos of Bron, um, you can do that um, and that will help a lot. But if you're going to hold the phone, use those grid lines to 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 keep your phone at the same angle each time. Um, one Sam mentioned to me, which is a really good one, was setting your focus. So phones will, what they'll do is you'll point your phone at something, and it will take in the whole um the whole environment that it can, and then it will focus on the foreground. 
So you can now change that. So obviously if you've got your phone open in front of you and you've got the camera open, you can just tap the screen and tell it where to focus. Um, so that's actually really quite a useful little function to, to, to use. Um, we've said previously, avoid the zoom function. Um, you know, this is like kind of digital zoom. It's not going to be the same kind of quality of zoom you can get on a DSLR. The technology just isn't there. So, um, do, if you need to get closer to your customer, do, um, rather than using the zoom function. Um, and Sam's mentioned briefly, don't use filters, no, no filters at all. I mean, if you go and look for a guide on how to take good smartphone photography, they'll often say, oh, take, use filters and use this and use that, but not for this. This is totally inappropriate for that. So um, definitely use those, um, use those filters and uh, do not use those filters even. Um, and a really good point here that yeah. you wouldn't really think of it usually because you just sort of get your phone out and point and shoot, but make sure your camera lens is clean. Um, so uh, uh, some nice you know, decent lens wipes, you know, that you've it's not dissimilar to what you'd use on cleaning a light guide or, um, or something like that. Um, I'm just thinking of the Exolite there. Um, but you know, making sure your camera lens is clean, um, you know, it's wiped off and nice and clean. So it doesn't create any artifacts on, on your photos. Um, cause you don't want to, you know, you don't want to stand there and go, I've just taken a, an amazing photo and then you open it in the photo app and you, all you can see is a big bit of fluff um it's really disheartening um so i guess what it all boils down to is consistency wherever possible so making sure that you have the same lighting the same environment wherever you can um use the same equipment i mean we've touched on that already um but that equipment doesn't have to cost the earth um i think on the next slide sam if you can um no, two slides, sorry. Mind uh, skipping forward very briefly for me. Um, just a couple of examples of equipment here. This is equipment I used for the photos I took before. That tripod was about £25. Um, the monopod in the middle, um, really helpful if you've got a small clinic space or maybe you rent a room um, and you don't have the room for a, the, the large footprint that a tripod has. So... Um, a monopod can be really good for that. You can just stand it and it's very kind of compact. Um, and on the right side of the screen there, it's just a very inexpensive phone mount. So uh, they tend to go from about seven, seven to 11 pounds for the most part. Fancy metal ones will run you about 25. I've never had a fancy metal one. I will just buy one of these. Um, so we've gone from, you know, we've gone from thousands of pounds of camera equipment to the phone in your hand plus maybe... 40 50 pounds um which is vastly more affordable um so i really like this floor um but... yeah i i love it too and yeah. we we're talking about consistency weren't we and consistency in environment and, and angles form a part of that so the great thing about this marker is if you have um your client uh put their feet on the matching numbers so one and one two and two three and three four and four um, the client will always be at a nice uh, straight angle and it's in, uh, in uh, inclinations of 45 degrees. So, you know, if, if you're taking, we did a bit of a test of this, didn't we, Sam? Cause we were, we were talking about this and, um, you asked me to face you and then you asked me to move and move again. And it's really hard to get an exact distance, but then I think we bunged one of these on the floor and I planted my feet and my angle was super consistent every time. All I had to do was stand up straight. <laughs> Especially if you have a marker on the floor for where you stand as a photographer yes. as well. So that I think is really, if you can do that. Absolutely. Um, and it's it's super, super helpful for consistency, especially because you get the 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 angle is the same every time. And it's one thing you don't have to sort of sort out. Um, great. So what also feeds into consistency there, sorry, just a um, previous point there is, to standardize before and afters across your business. Even if you're a sole trader, have a process in place. This is how I take before and afters. This is the environment I set up. So this is me getting consent. Here's how I take them. Here's how I get them ready for, for publishing, et cetera. Having, having a process in your business that you can follow, that you can train team members on, 
to, you know, uh, you can go to your assistant and say, right, this is how we take before and afters. This is the process to follow. And if you're and always stick- doing it before every treatment, it just becomes, you know. Oh, yeah. It becomes less of a process, doesn't it? It becomes, it just becomes second nature. But it's it's definitely worth putting the time into saying this is the process of how we do it because it will it will help you from a business perspective as well. Um, and just to end that slide there, just practice makes progress it's you know just like any other clinical skill you'll develop good photography for before and afters is a skill and it's a learned skill so keep going at it keep trying to get better at it and and it will come in time so um yeah don't feel you need to go out and spend all the money and do all this and all that no just um make make the best with with what you've got at the moment and and you will just keep getting better at it we all have to start somewhere um, so yeah, it's just a couple of bits on environment, really. So we said previously that iPhones and and, and smartphones in general um, are sort of at the mercy of the environment you put them in, just because so much of what they do is automatic. So things like your angles, maybe using a marker on the floor, like we uh, talked about. Um, things like the colors, so the color of your light, if you can tell whether your bulb is white or yellow, um, and you know just knowing that is uh, can be can be very helpful. Um, a distance as well and this can be a little bit more difficult especially if you've got different areas of the body you're photographing but always try and use the same distance every time and don't be afraid to get a little bit of paper tape and pop it on the floor that's where you're standing and that's where I stand and, and, and standardizing those distances because it's going to reduce the need to sort of do more setup to be consistent um, and you can you can fix your camera. I did in the f- example photographs I took. I planted the tripod there, and I didn't touch it. All I did was tap the the phone screen. So no matter what I was messing with in my environment, the tripod stood still, and that was that was great. Um, but yes, you know, white backgrounds are best. No clutter, nice and nice and plain. It uh, gives the phone less work to do and lets it focus on your subject. I would say as well, you know, have your blinds down because then it doesn't matter whether it's dark outside or it's sunny Mm. outside or it's overcast outside, you know, your lighting then will be consistent all the time, won't it? Definitely. Skip through those. Ah, yes. Someone had a a really good question about Mm. tools for making people, uh, well, I don't know if you could do it unrecognisable, but apart from cropping, is there anything else that we can do? Yes, definitely. So we've, we've touched on the idea that we we prepare pics. So we've, we've, we've gotten our consent, we've taken our photos. Where do we go from there? So um, yes, we, we prepare photos, we don't edit them. So, and I think that's a really important distinction to make, but there are lots of great tools out there to sort of prepare our, our photos for, for publication. So uh, Pic Collage is a really good one. You've seen a couple of examples of that um, so far. Um, there are lots of free apps out there. Um, the pink square there is a, called Layout from Instagram. So you can just stack photos next to each other and do crop and zoom in the uh, all in the app. Um, down at the bottom there is something called Adobe Express, which is like an online browser-based um, editing tool. Um, but the big circle there, um, and it's the biggest circle because I like it the most, is uh, it's called Canva. Now, Canva is a fantastic editing tool. The free version is unbelievably good. I've been using Canva for about seven years now. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's great for doing uh, cropping, zooming. You can create um uh, canvases that are the exact size of social media posts. So, you know, a good 1080 by 1080 P um, picture for Instagram, you can create that and then deposit your photos into it and then um, mark them up or crop and zoom. It's absolutely fantastic. I would recommend using it. Yeah. www.canva.com and it's a desktop app and it's a phone app as well. So you can download it on your phone and have access to the the photos there and you can once you've created a template you really like you can just keep copying the design and there's your standardized template um that so it makes your social media feeds standardized as well i guess yeah so you can you can create 
canvassized it at will. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and you can also, if you nip onto the next slide for me. And is um, that free, Jake? It is free. It is. The, the free version of Canva is fantastic. It's really good. Um, so I'd recommend it. So I, with this, I just did a couple of examples. I mean, I think you know who that is by now. Um, but, um, you know, I, I gave myself five minutes and those photos and a logo and nothing else. And I said, I've got five minutes to create three templates. And I made those three. And that, and all I did was dump the original photos into Canva, one logo, and I was able to put black bars across uh, bronze eyes. And so, yeah, this is a tool that you can do that with. You can just insert a shape and then crop it to the right size. When you download the photo, it embeds it into the photo as well. So no one's going to be moving that black bar around because um, it's it's part of the image. And the same um, mark then, I guess. You can't... Move. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the Linton logo is here. Um, I've, I've popped the logo on and faded it out, which is all done in Canva. Uh, faded it out and um, I've downloaded that and that's part of the image. If I tried to split that image in two, it would split the logo in two as well because it's just embedded. So in five minutes, I created three templates, um, and it um, it's that it is that easy. It's point and press, and uh, you can't break it. It's uh, and no Canva really is a fantastic tool. I would highly recommend having a play with it. Can you do things like pixelate, you know, areas with Canva? Um, that's a really good question. I think you can do some kind of selective blurring, but like I say, um, with a lot of the a lot of the standardization you sort of see black bars and and that is like that's a you can just do it like that um but i would definitely encourage going and having a look signing up for an account and just having a play with it it's super good great tool um yeah this sort of brings us to the end doesn't it sam uh, pretty much so um yeah, yeah i mean we've got a few questions as well oh yes definitely to, but but basically you know you, you, as I said before, you need to be demonstrating your fantastic results. People sometimes don't realise, but I, I, you know, I've spoke to people who've, you know, had age spots going back to age spots on the hands, and you know, I just have no idea that those sorts of things can be treated. So if you're you're putting that on your social media, there'll be someone out there that'll say, "Oh, I can get rid of those veins or the little spider nevus, or you know, get some jaw lift or whatever it might be." So, you know, you must be taking these pictures and using them where you can as well. And I guess putting a process in place that everyone follows so that you regularly are taking pictures. Um, and I'd also say, you know, it's not like the old days where you had to get things, uh, films developed. So take lots of them. There's nothing stopping you taking a couple of photographs of, you know, each different angle um, and just being consistent with your lighting, I guess, is the the really key one yeah definitely i mean before and afters present a huge opportunity not just for not just for marketing and promotion and winning new business but for for show for showcasing your ongoing value to your clients um it's it's a super tool um you know for, for example um i'm sort of i'm having some treatment at the moment and i couldn't remember what it was like before um and i've got sort of a couple of photos but now i can definitely tell the difference because i've got photos that my uh, the people who treated me at linton have shown me and it's it's great to see that progress it's so it's really good to sort of demonstrate that ongoing value so being consistent so just like any other good business process make it nice and consistent yeah. and something that that everyone can sort of buy into it's it's setting up that photo station, isn't it? Having mm. the same area where you always take your photographs. And then you ask the question about whether it's better to do it standing up or lying down. Well, mm. I mean, if you're consistent, it doesn't really matter, I guess. My preference would always be standing up because then, especially if you're doing things like, you know, skin rejuvenation type treatment, you can you saw the difference in mm. that the picture that we saw. If someone's lying down or standing up. You, you, you're getting a true reflection if they're standing up, aren't you? You can look at, you can see laxity and things like that. And Definitely. You'll also have a plain background, hopefully, if they're standing up. Whereas if Definitely. they're on the head, then, you know, you've got towels behind or whatever it might be. I mean, I think it's it's also worth bearing in mind that you've got, um, you know, sat, standing up or, sit, or lying down being the examples, you know, the, um, the lady there where she was lying down in one and standing up in the other is is not, optimal but sometimes as long as they're both the same like you know sam mentions the consistency there you've got 
if you've got a patient who might be more comfortable lying down, as long as they're lying down both times, you're more likely to get the more consistent photo out of it. So don't feel like, you, yes, you've got a process in place, but don't feel like everyone has to stand all the time and you know do you can still tailor it to your clients as long as you're being as consistent as you possibly can with that client you know you you need to take those photographs before they even Mm. get on the bed you know but after they've signed the consent you stand them up against the wall and you take the photographs someone's put a comment on saying that the the, uh, lighting in these pictures isn't the same and yes we know that (laughs) that's yeah so that that was um... examples of of, yeah of how yeah so yeah so I, I took um i think i took four photographs and i thought i know they're sort of different lighting conditions but i wanted to say see, see how quickly i could put together just a pair of photos each time so no i i do appreciate that the the lighting is a bit different in those yeah. pictures they're examples of bad before and afters <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, has anyone got any other questions? Let me have a quick look through and see if we've missed anything. This is a great question, I think, Sam, um, from from Nicola. Would you recommend black and white pictures for pigmentation or is it best to use colour? I think that's a great question. Yeah, I I would generally use colour. There are, you've probably seen the skin analysis um, platforms that you can get where they do, they can look at, just melanin content in the skin they can look at hemoglobin and, and lots of those are sometimes black and white but I think um well I mean I guess that you you want to take your photos initially in color I would say and although I just said you know don't use any filters I suppose you know if you if it really clearly demonstrates there's nothing to you know stop you to try and both if you can but but I guess people really want to see the the real result and that's going to be more um more obvious in a color photo definitely i mean it's worth mentioning here that um you know with with smartphone technology being as good as it is your cameras do have those modes so what you can do is you know get them to stand still and say right take a uh you know take a photo in color and then take one in black and white and you can do that basically side by side so um you know but what you're doing there is you're creating the best possible photo first rather than applying effects to it in post um, and and I would always recommend taking the best possible photo first so that you don't have to do anything to it later. Yeah. Another photo about taking pictures after after patch tests, then, you know, yes, that can be really useful to show the skin reaction after treatment. Mm. Um, but, you know, if you want to show, if you, if you want it for marketing, then really what you, you need people to come back in after treatment I know that can be difficult <laughs> but you know if, if someone's had a course of skin rejuvenation treatments for example that collagenesis it's going to take three months or so to get the best results so ideally you want them back in at that point mm. so you know before doing any treatment but certainly yeah you know taking pictures um, immediately after treatment uh, although m- might not be as useful for, for social media is, is really good to you know keep on file for that person I would say. Mm. Definitely. I've um, got one here. How about UV or polarized light? That's a very good question. Yeah, so that can be really useful for, for things like pigmentation, like a woods lamp. That, you know, mm. so, so certainly, yeah, if you have them, that's great. Videos, again, that's another, you know, brilliant for social media. Mm. Um, but I think, I think with videos, the, the, same, the same principles tend to apply, and it's just making sure that, and, and it all sort of comes back to creating the best possible environment for your equipment to succeed in. Um, and so, you know, if you're taking videos, especially if you're taking them with a smartphone, just making sure you've got that nice, consistent environment where possible to, to kind of to show off your show off your great results, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. Uh, in a salon with numerous therapists, where would you store pictures? Um, Ooh. what, what oh. we do at our clinic is we have a clinic iPad and that's what we use, um, for, for taking photos. Um, now if you've got multiple Apple devices, you can store all of those in, or, you know, or Android, I would guess, um, you can store all of those in one location. Um, but what you, I guess what you don't want is one of your clinicians using their, you know, their iPhone 13, someone else using their Samsung, someone else using, you know, 
so if if they're all it's yeah it's better where possible if they can yeah if, if you've got if you've got a um if you've got a um one device that a clinic uses then you can have it on one iCloud account one uh google cloud account or whichever it is and um, that's that's sort of that's ideal if you if you if you can but if you have just a, as part of the business process you set up you have a defined place where you store these things and how you name them and 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 structure them uh, so you can use things like google drive is is great for that um onedrive uh, from microsoft is is another good option um or even icloud so um i just by preference work with google drive or or onedrive um, despite being a diehard Apple fan, but that's a that's a different that's a story for a different day. Um, yeah, so as long as you've got a clear idea of of how it's stored, where it's stored, and how it's named, it's you can you can use any of those services to really kind of get the most out of it. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, name and date is always useful. I mean, you should have the the the, the date that the photo is taken on the file anyway, so that's fine. But um, yeah. Or if you have pre-treatment number four or whatever, something like that, that's useful too, I guess. Uh, okay, I think that's it for questions, um, unless anyone can type one very quickly. So, uh, Jake, thank you very much for all those really helpful tips. Um, no, thank you very much. And yeah, we'll. This has been recorded, so we'll put we'll put the link on the um, on our socials and uh, pop it onto YouTube at some point. So, all right. Thanks very much for your time, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.